All right, everyone, welcome back. After dinner, I hope your dinner break was enjoyable. I'm gonna move into the last two sections for the seminar this evening, and if time permits, we'll do a question and answer session afterward. I'll try to move through these rather swiftly. There's not too much material left. Like I said, two sections. I'm gonna break down some of the dark occult symbolism in National Reconnaissance Office, or NRO, launch mission patches. And I think uh, after I show you these patches, you'll agree that there are forces at work in government and in these intelligence offices that most certainly have a bizarre religion and a bizarre uh, sense of what symbolism they find attractive, let's say. So again, the NRO is the office that has the least amount of employees working for them officially and the largest intelligence budget allocated to that department. Let's start looking at some of their symbolism in, in their mission patches. So this is one of their patches that uh, essentially contains, of course, the all-seeing eye. Now, what you're going to see here also is constant images of these uh, symbols floating above or over the earth. And you'll, you'll see stars as well. Now, this four part, the, these four stars, pe people have suggested the four, and you'll see um, a six star configuration as well with five and one. Some people have suggested that this represents different areas from which these satellites were worked on and maybe launched. You know, there's an area in uh, the Groom Lake facility called Area 4 or S4. You know, four stars here could indicate that. I'm not saying it definitely does. But you'll see some uh, patches with, you know, uh, five stars together and then one offset. And people think that that means Area 51. But this, uh, this patch, um, which is their fleet operation patch, that's what FLT Ops stands for. Uh, the Latin insignia underneath it, nos no una, nos abeo una, means we float together or we swim together. But, you know, in this connotation, it means, you know, we swim together in the sky or in space, okay? And we depart together. So nos no, nos no una means we float or swim together in Latin. And then nos abeo una means we depart together meaning we arrive together as a flotilla and we leave or depart together as a flotilla. Now, my take on this is, you know, how many people have seen these so-called UFO fleets? You know, we don't know what these things are. If you've ever seen the videos, they certainly float together and when they leave, they leave together. You know, I'm not saying that's definitely what this is a reference to, but it kind of does make you think what kind of very exotic, if not otherworldly technologies these people are working on and are putting in our skies. This is one of the most blatantly dark occult and satanic patches I've ever seen from the symbolism and Latin insignia that is on it. Again, you see the four stars. You'll see that over and over again, more likely than not representing S4. If I had to take a best guesstimate, I would say that's what those four stars represent, although I could be incorrect about that. Now, you see the all-seeing eye in the pyramid, okay? And then the NRO patch uh, designation, the mission designation. Now, we saw what the all-seeing eye represented. It represents God, divinity, okay? The light of the creator. And, of course, the pyramid, the, the stone representing the, the block to that light. Now, what makes this satanic is the fact that the rocket carrying the payload or the, the mission satellite is getting ready to fly over the top of the all-seeing eye in its trajectory. Now that in and of itself would not be so sinister, but what makes it sinister is the Latin term supra sumus. I know that's a little bit difficult to see on this screen. Hopefully people can see that. It's S-U-P-R-A-S-U-M-M-U-S, supra sumus. In Latin that means Get ready for this. Higher than the most high. Okay? Higher than the most high. In other words, 
we're higher than God. Because we're putting these satellites in such a high orbit, it sees everything that's going on on the earth. You know, we look at ourselves as the all-seeing eye. We're higher than God. Now, to me, they can't get any more blasphemous or blatant than that. But, you know, you'll see how far they go. Here's one. Their mission launch was number 32, XXXII in Roman numerals. Of course, that is the last level of Freemasonry before what is known as illuminized or illuminated Freemasonry, representing levels 33 and above. The 32 to 33 degrees in Freemasonry represents the difference between frozen water and flowing water, ice or liquid water. You know, the, the heat of the sun or the light melts water at 33 degrees and changes it from ice into flowing liquid water. What I wanted to point out here is the blatantly bird-like or reptilian eye symbolism. That's definitely not a human eye in this iconography. We're talking about something that has scales over top of it toward the right-hand side for sure. You know, people want to say, oh, the all-seeing eye on the back of the dollar bill is reptilian. It's, it, you know, that's from the, the, uh, the type of uh, pattern that that engraving system that that was originally, you know, cut with or engraved with, you know, the pattern that it takes on. It doesn't represent, it represents a human eye, a human styled eye. This clearly is not a human styled eye and has very uh, um, bird-like or possibly uh, serpent-like connotation to it. Again, I'm going to follow themes with these where, you know, we're looking at all seeing eye symbolism within these mission patches. <coughs> Here's one, Anuit Coeptus, again, the all seeing eye very clearly um, portrayed. Again, you have the number four inside the triangle at the bottom. The number four or four stars comes up over and over and over again in these patches. Again, NROL stands for National Reconnaissance Office Launch, number 32. Again, there's that 32 number as well. Here's some owl symbolism contained in National Reconnaissance patch from 2000, uh, and the, the phrase, we own the night, clearly with a reference to being able to see in the dark, or surveil in the dark. Okay, we're going to go through some that have blatantly satanic overtones to them as far as Luciferian symbolism or blatant satanic symbolism. So this is launch number 49, clearly with uh, a, a demon or fallen angel form in it that they have named Betty here and it's obscuring the sun with its wing holding some kind of a trident and a wrench in the other hand with its hair on fire and a serpent like snake going around its body then you see the earth partly occulted by shadow and underneath it it says primoris gravis ex ocasus which means in Latin First and important from the fall is the best that I can translate that. Or first and grave or heavy or important from the fall. Now what that means is obviously very uh, occulted. Now I couldn't tell you what this mission is ultimately about, but clearly there's blatant satanic symbolism in it and the earth is in shadow. And Acasus could also mean sunset. So you see the sun being obscured. If you look at that as, if you turn that and look at it as hills and the sun going behind it, it could be construed as a sunset. And you see the shadow of the earth, you know, representing the, you know, the uh, uh, line between light and darkness as the sun sets or rises. So um, Acasus could mean the fall, clearly resonating with fallen angel symbolism, but it could also mean sunset or the obscuration or occultation of light. So very clear satanic overtones or Luciferian overtones there. Here's one, NROL 66, National Reconnaissance Office Launch 66, get your kicks on 66, with a clear representation of um, you know, the Baal figure, the bull, uh, you know, representation of Satan. Uh, again, that's what these Moloch ceremonies usually were uh, dedicated to the bull god Molech. So this, that's a depiction of Molech if there ever was one as far as I'm concerned. 
Here's one with the Egyptian uh, god of the underworld, Anubis, depicted, looking very sinister with red eyes and you know, fangs and a, a you know, tongue out. And the blatant phallic symbol of the, uh, you know, the, the missile coming up from the earth. <laughs> yep. Here's more blatant satanic symbolism, Pan, standing for ostensibly Palladium at night. But Pan, of course, is another uh, demon uh, figure in a certain, um, uh, you know, pagan mythology. So... Here's another one representing the phoenix, and it says, or, and flames, you know, clearly, uh, you know, satanic or diabolical overtones there. The, the phrase, melior diabolus quem skies, means better the devil you know. In other words, you know, you'd rather have us doing this than somehow the devil you don't know going out there and doing this. So, you know, it, it, we have your interest in mind. You know, you, you better trust us better the devil you know with the American flag behind the, uh, the phoenix. Here's one that is a clear reference to dark occultists not wanting anybody to get involved in their business. It's a blatant warning or threat. And this is special projects of the NRO with a dragon coming out of the clouds shooting lightning bolts down. You'll see a repeated... Uh, imagery of dragons, lightning bolts pointed at or down at the earth. And um, the Latin insignia at the top says, procul este profani, which means away with the profane. The profane are not welcome here, in other words. Okay? Away with the profane. They're telling people if you're not on the inner circle, if you're not in the esoteric circle, if you're not with us, with the initiates, the sorcerers who do this type of hidden covert science work, then you are one of the profane and your eyes are not welcome here. You know, for people who want to look into the connections of you know, NASA and the occult or you know, space agencies in the United States in general and the occult, I mean, it's a rabbit hole. I mean, you could study that for a lifetime in and of itself how many you know, dark magicians are invo were involved in different uh, space agencies. And they're clearly telling you who they are and telling you you're not welcome. Here's more, so this section is all about dragons. You know, a dragon is a symbol of power, authority, knowledge, hidden knowledge especially. And um, this one you have the dragon holding the entire planet, surrounding the entire planet, you know, as if he's either you know, it's his child or perhaps he's uh, getting ready to eat it. But it says, Omnis Vestri, Substructio, Es Servus Ad Nobis. And this is a very broken Latin uh, phrase. It's not really structured properly in Latin deliberately. I'll tell you what it means in a moment, but I just want to point out there's that five-in-one star configuration that I talked about that some people have suggested represents Area 5-1 or 51. Again, May Day is a big occult satanic holiday known as Valpurgisnacht. All right, Valpurgisnacht or Beltane. It means bell's wheel, the beginning of the, um, uh, or the midpoint of the spring season, I should say, where uh, sacrifice in the form of blood sacrifice was traditionally offered toward the sun and the earth in order to ensure uh, bountiful spring growth so there, there would be a bountiful harvest in the, uh, the um, reaping season. So, omnis vestri substructio es service ad nobis means all your base are belong to us. Now, for people who may know what that means, it's a, it's a, it, there, there's a reason it's in that um, uh, very improper grammar. Uh, it's a, a reference to a big internet meme that was going around in the early 2000s, I believe, uh, where um, some video game manufacturer from Japan had put out this uh, video game with all kinds of grammatical errors in English, where they didn't even, you know, check the grammar, and they put out, you know, this, this game that had laughably bad English in it. 
And one of the phrases that the mission commander, the evil mission commander, says to the good guys is, all your base are belong to us. Meaning, you know, we're going to take all your bases now, but they didn't get the translation right in the game, in the video game. So they were kind of playing on this, this theme, saying all your base are belong to us, because clearly what this probably is, is a reconnaissance mission to send satellites up to uh, penetrate into underground uh, bunkers or underground bases. And they're basically saying you have nowhere to hide. Here's another dragon holding the earth. This is a repeated theme throughout. He's uh, got a diamond in his tail. And of course, uh, he's an American dragon. He has the American flag as his wings, you know. This is a wonderful American symbolism, don't you think? I mean, you know, that's, uh, that's American through and through there. <coughs> Here's more snakes curled around the earth. You know, serpent symbolism. Again, you see this repeated theme of four stars and then one. Here's, uh, you know, four stars over here and then two. Not quite sure what the stars um, really represent there, but clearly you have more um, reptilian symbolism surrounding the earth. The Latin phrase numquam ante numquam iterum means never before and never again. And again, I can't tell you what that means. It's obviously inside knowledge regarding whatever this particular mission or launch was about. The Information Assurance Office works closely with the NRO. They call themselves the defenders of the domain. You know, this concept of knighthood as if it's something that was so valiant when really what the knights were were the protectors of the, 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 the king's land, you know, basically reinforcing feudalism. And what they're doing is they're showing you we're constructing the world grid, you know, where there's total surveillance all the time. It, and <laughs> that's the earth in a cage. I mean, the symbol right there is the earth inside of a cage. And these people think they're somehow creating or defending freedom, you know. Oh, they're defenders of the domain of slavery, all right. They're defenders of the domain of feudalism, for sure. Here's some blatant alien symbolism, and I would say demonic symbolism. I've broken down how, uh, I've broken down in my uh, occult mockery presentation how the Air Force logo is actually a demon's face. I mean, if you look at it, you know, the eyes, you have the brows, the horns going up, the, 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 the nose coming down, and then the, the mouth looking very sinister. Um, you know, I could see it very clearly. I don't know how people who revere the symbol cannot see that that's a demon's face. And if I had to make a best guesstimate, that's the demon known as Chort. In every depiction I've ever seen of Chort portrayed, that's his face. You know, I could be wrong about that, but um, it certainly looks like it to me. Then you have the typical alien gray with the huge almond black eyes, almond shaped black eyes, no nose, no mouth to speak of, and large head, the uh, typical alien gray. Um, the phrase underneath says, uh, Oderant dum metuant, which means let them hate as long as they fear. I mean, is that like something, you know, that depicts American values? Yeah, that's, I, I believe that is some, um, a phrase first uttered by the Roman emperor Caligula, if I'm not mistaken. So that's a statement by Caligula. Oderant dum metuant meant um, let them hate as long as they fear. They can hate me as long as they fear me. It's like saying, you know, we're in control, we know we're in control, and you can hate it all you want as long as you're afraid. You know, it's, it's, it's blatant posturing. You know, it's, the, it's up in your face as far as I'm concerned. And what is the reference, what is the direct connection to these alien greys is what I want to know. I mean, you know, why is this on a United States mission patch, a grey alien face? People don't think there's anything weird to that. You know, they're just playing games. They're just having some fun and, you know, putting some stuff that they don't really believe in on their patches. That's all. You know, yeah. <laughs> Here's another alien gray eating a B-2 bomber. And I say eating because I know what the phrase means underneath. This is a, a classified f flight test number 509. I do not know what those trident symbols are in the background. And it has something that looks like a male symbol on the, on the uh, B-2 bomber there, but it doesn't have the arrow. It's not a feminine symbol. It's like a, a, an O with a little, uh, you know, kind of uh, protrusion coming out of it. But uh, the alien seems to be 
devouring this B2 bomber, and gustas similis pullus means tastes like chicken. <laughs> so I guess that's a reference to the alien's t taste of the B2 bomber. I mean, they get weirder and weirder, folks, you know? I mean, they're, it's perfectly normal, well, adju well psychologically adjusted people working in this office, clearly, with pure American values. This is the most recent one, Launch 39, happened, I, or it might not be the most recent, but it's a very recent one. This went off in 2013. An octopus, basically a devouring the earth with its tentacles all over the earth. And it says, nothing is beyond our reach. I, I don't know how much more blatant you want to get. I mean, you know, they're telling you, we, I mean, this is, this is Cthulhu-like in its scope, you know. The macrobes, you know, of Lovecraftian uh, uh, visage here, you know, just uh, holding the earth in its grip. You know, I, I don't personally think anybody who sees this as super sinister is making any kind of a big deal about it. I think it speaks for itself. I mean, if you can't see that, that there's sinister overtones to that, you know, big, huge, Cthulhu-like <laughs> demon octopus entity devouring the earth, you know, and that's what they are. I mean, they're really telling you what they're doing, as far as I'm concerned. Here's more alien or demonic or shadow people uh, symbolism with this chevron shape that keeps appearing over and over again. 23D, space operations, semper vigilans, which means always watching or always watchful. Now I'm going to move into uh, some of these mission patches that deal with um, clearly occultic imagery, clearly wizard imagery. You know, so, uh, certain subdivisions of the, the people within the NRO actually refer to themselves as the wizards, I have heard, okay, through people who have studied some of this, uh, um, you know, uh, space aspects to the control system a little bit more they have put forward that there's, you know, certain special mission teams within these organizations that refer to themselves as the wizards or the sorcerers because they have the highest level inside knowledge about what the actual purpose of these missions are, whereas everybody else is on a need-to-know basis. So they're the inner circle of the inner circle, you might say. And in this case, it's the flight test squadron you see a uh, like a, a, a sword, a sorcerer's sword there. It's the sorcerer sending a lightning bolt down to the mountains. He's in some kind of a chevron-shaped craft. He's holding that O-shaped thing with the little protrusion coming out of it. You know, I can't tell you what that is because I don't know. And um, you know, he's casting some kind of a spell, and there you see that star configuration once again, the five and the one repeated again. And, you know, if anybody sees anything that I don't, I'm welcome to interpretations. Email me or, you know, just get a hold of me afterward and, you know, tell me what you thought or what you saw. If I missed something or didn't touch on something, that's fine. Please do bring it to my attention. Here's more wizard symbology. This whole section will deal with wizards and sorcerers. Uh, they don't have anything to do with the occult, these people. Don't worry about it, folks. It's completely innocent. These people are not occultists. They're not dark occultists. They're not involved in this in any way. Um, you know, he's again holding a, um, some type of a uh, scepter, um, presiding over the earth. Again, there's that lightning bolt. You have the, uh, the, the craft sending some kind of a satellite into orbit. One star over the wizard's hat. I don't know what the, fray, what the letters CW represent, but um, the Latin translation of Arcana Imperii is imperial secret knowledge or secret knowledge of the empire you know because we have an empire right you know this is an empire it wasn't intended to be a republic we're an empire and we have the secret knowledge of the empire is what they're telling you you know they're the wizards who have the secret knowledge of how these covert sciences really work here's more wizard electric wizard symbology i guess you could call this over and over again, lightning bolts pointed at the earth. This is all about, I feel, scalar technology. 
and you know the ability to create uh, energy systems at will. Um, it's a perverted application of some of Tesla's patents and technologies and higher level uh, sciences that he was working on to bring forward for the betterment of humanity. And then these dark, sick, psychopathic sorcerers took all that and employed it for destructive purposes and control purposes, as they always do. That's all they can do, is take somebody else's work and pervert it. So here's a, one other one. You know, the same motif once again, clearly depicted the scepter shooting the lightning bolt down at the earth with the orb in his other hand. Here's more uh, blatantly wizard, uh, dark wizard iconography here. I'm not sure what they're getting at, what that object going into that ball is. It could be wormhole symbolism for all I know, you know. Your guess is probably as good as mine. Uh, yeah, they're assessing the future all right. They're assessing the future for total takeover and slavery. And then they get, you know, purely dark, you know. Don't ask because it's none of your effing business. But, you know, maybe this had something to do with the moon. We have the crescent moon on there and then the question mark. They're not even going to give you any hints or symbolism. And, uh, you know, then it gets even worse than that because then there's just the blank one, you know, that says, Si ego certiorem faciam mihi tu delendus eris. I guess my Latin pronunciation is not too shabby. It might not be perfect, but that means if I made you aware, you would have to be destroyed by me or I would have to kill you. So if I told you about what this is about, I would have to kill you. That's what that loosely translates to. And there's nothing in the middle of the patch. I hear they're available for kids' birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> A great group of guys you'd probably want to hang out with. <laughs> They're clearly very mentally balanced. Okay, so look, in that section, for all I have to say is if anybody looking at the occult symbology of those patches doesn't understand that at the highest levels of intelligence and government in this country, you have people who are involved in a sick religion, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, they're telling you. I don't need to say a word. They're telling you right there. This is the last section for today, and if time al allows, I will take some questions at the end. I just want to briefly mention, um, we do have a um, raffle that we were running. There's three prizes that I'm going to be giving out at the end. So if people uh, want to make any last minute uh, raffle tickets, Barb has them at the desk. I'll take a little bit of time after the finish of the lecture, and then we'll, we will hold a raffle drawing. We'll do three prizes. One prize will be a DVD of your choice, one prize will be a t-shirt, and one prize will be a combination, a t-shirt and a DVD of your choice. Those will be the three prizes for the raffle. So I just wanted to mention that. I apologize for forgetting to mention that at the beginning of this section, like I was supposed to. But um, the tarot's major arcana, the self and the universe revealed in symbol. Okay, now I'm gonna do this in a very simple way, but I'm gonna try to wrap, to, to tie together a few different occult traditions in this section, namely the Tarot and Kabbalah, and help people to understand how occult traditions cannot really be studied in isolation. They have to be studied with respect to each other. This is critically important when it comes to how these traditions cross over, how they, their symbolism all interrelates with each other. And I think if you really understand how I'm going to lay this out, some people will have seen me do this in my own podcast, but I'm going to lay it out in a little bit nicer of a way uh, for this presentation. If you can really understand the correlations between these symbols, this section is so powerful. When I understood this, when I studied the tarot in conjunction with the Kabbalah deeply enough to make this connection, with the help of some other occultists and researchers. It's like it was beyond a, a, an epiphany. It was beyond an aha moment. It was like, you know, it was beyond getting chills up your spine. It was, you know, it was like the top of my head completely blew off, you know. Um, epiphany is an understatement when it comes to it because you realize how powerfully interconnected the people that made these systems were with this knowledge. You know, these, these
these symbolic systems that are intended to teach wordlessly through symbol and allegory. Um, the people who came up with them were beyond brilliant. And hopefully I can get people to see that and it will spark some of your own personal study on your own in these traditions. So we broke down the, in a rudimentary way, we broke down the Kabbalistic tree of life earlier. Remember, it represents different aspects of the human consciousness. And the whole goal of the Kabbalah was to teach a moral lesson. It was to teach how we could bring ourselves into harmony with the higher consciousness and in, higher, in harmony with natural law. And in order to do that, we have to develop the desire to get out of the base consciousness, Malkuth as it is known, kingdom, okay? And we have to first develop that desire which comes up from the sacrum chakra, you know, that uh, sexual union energy of, you know, the desire to better oneself and transform oneself and then develop the willpower to care enough to transform ourselves, help the process of transformation in, other, in others, acquire the understanding of natural law principles, and then put those to work in our life through our actions. When we do that, that's when we are truly communi communing with divine consciousness or with unity consciousness, uh, the top level of the tree of life, Keter. Again, we talked about the correspondence to the Vedic system of chakras and how these systems kind of like had some interplay uh, with their symbolism. What I want to do here today is show you how the tarot must be studied in conjunction with the Kabbalistic tree of life. They're inseparable. They go together and can't be studied in isolation from each other if they're to be truly understood. Now, how many spheres are on the tree of life? Ten. Ten major sephirot, right? The sphere called Da'at was not one of the sephirot. It was considered in the Kabbalistic tradition the place from which the tree grows or the origin of the tree. It is the essence of the tree. And it represents knowledge. The word Da'at in Hebrew means knowledge. So, if we look at that as the essence of one of the trees in Kabbalah, we have really two trees of life. There's a macrocosmic tree and a microcosmic tree. These two trees are talked about in biblical symbolism in the book of Revelation. All right? And what they really represent is the mac microcosmic tree of the qualities of the self and then the macrocosmic tree of the qualities of nature, of the universe. So what I did right here is I took the first 11 cards of the major arcana and I dealt them in a very specific progression onto the Kabbalistic tree of life. We're going to do the same for the second 11 cards with the macrocosmic tree of life, all right? So 22 cards in the major arcana, 11, 11, there's another very spiritual number, a very significant um, synchronistic and synchromistic number, 1111. Okay, how many people, just, just off the cuff, uh, you know, just uh, you know, on a whim here, how many people have personal experience or personal synchronicity with the number 1111 by a show of hands? Okay, that's maybe a third of the room. 1111 is known as the light worker's call. What it means is, if you're seeing this over and over and over again, let me tell you something. When I was starting to wake up, I saw 1111 so much. It was like so haunting that I was tired of seeing it. It was, it was so bizarre. At some point, it was just like, oh, yeah, again, really? Non-stop, non-stop. What I feel it means is that if you're receiving that, it means you're at a level of development already that you need to go forward and you need to communicate the information that you already know. You're one of the people who, I don't even want to use the word chosen or selected. That's not the right word. You have an aptitude for the gift of teaching in some form or fashion. And therefore, this repeating number 
is getting in your head and it's getting in your face and it's saying, start to do the work. At least that's what it was for me. That was my experience with the number. And there's a general consensus, you know, in the, the analysis of this meme going around, an analysis of this experience, if you will, of 1111. The reason I'm bringing it up is because 1111 is in, symbolically encoded in this breakdown that I'm putting forward. We're do, using 11 cards, the first half of the major arcana in the microcosmic tree, and then the second 11 cards in the macrocosmic tree. Now, how I have dealt them is simply in that order that we talked about of the, the, the spheres, the sephirotes numbered system. At the top where you have uh, Malkuth, that's one. Then you move to the right side, that's two. Then to the left side, that's three. Then you move down a notch, that's four. And then to the other side, that's five. Then to the center, Tiferet, the green card there, that's six. Then down to the yellow level on the right, that's seven. The yellow level on the left, that's eight. The middle orange card there, represented by the hermit, that's nine. And then finally, 10 at the Wheel of Fortune. Okay, so that's that, remember that Kabbalistic lightning bolt, the thunderstruck tree, all right, that pattern of one through 10 going like this, all right? Now, in the dot position, I have put the card, the fool. The fool is in the dot position. What is the first body of knowledge in the occult? It's the knowledge of self. It's the knowledge of the human psyche and how it operates. That's the dot position, the knowledge of self. This is the self card. It's properly understood. It's not the fool card. It's the soul card. Okay, that's an actual phonetic and written English letter variant, how it became the fool. If you even look into the history of this card, it was not originally the fool card. It was originally the soul card. And then through phonetic variants and, you know, mistransliterations, it became over time the fool, and that got ran with, it got ran with that in the imagery. You know, the being going off into the land of incarnation without much knowledge and, you know, without a whole lot of baggage to back him up, taking a leap of faith coming into this world, trying to make any change happen here. That's certainly a fool's errand, isn't it? But, um, you know, not to be dissuaded from that work, this is also a leap of faith and an act of will that he's going to go into that realm and survive it and create a change because it's not just him being in a naive state, it's him also being in a trusting state with the light at his back. You know, the light has his back, the sun. It's the sun card. You know, the zero card, it's the no thing. It's the pure essence of spirit or the spark of the divine. Amazing symbolism, and just containing that one card. I could give a whole lecture just on that one card. Um, but, you know, we're putting him in the dot position because this tree is about the knowledge of self as the microcosmic layer of knowledge in the occult. Okay? So, then we're going to look at all ten of the cards, but backwards from ten to one. This is the fool's journey. The fool's journey from darkness and ignorance at the bottom of the tree in Malkuth, in world, worldly earthbound identification, all the way up to the position of self-mastery as the magician or the magi at the, the crown level of Keter on the tree of life. So here we go with the journey of the soul, the journey of the self, the fool's journey. And there I'm showing where the fool is at, at the dot position. All right, now we're going to start at Malkuth. Let's go down to Malkuth, the bottom of the tree of life, at the Wheel of Fortune, card number 10. The Wheel of Fortune represents pure earth identification. It represents not really having knowledge. That's why you're on the wheel. It's the Wheel of Karma. When we are in ignorance, we are subject. We're not in a state of self-mastery. We are subjects. We are ruled by the, the forces. We are ruled by the base instincts, the base passions. Okay, so 
Uh, this staying at this level of earthly identification and base identification and you know base instinct, instinctual feeding, will keep us on the wheel of karma. We're not going to grow and and learn and progress. What gets us out of this earthbound identification is desire. And I don't mean just desire to want things in an egoic way. I'm talking about the desire for more, the desire for betterment within the self, okay? The desire for self-knowledge, the desire to know oneself, and then to know also about the realm in which we operate, the natural world and its laws. So when we make that decision to develop that desire for truth, for light, for knowledge, that's where the hermit comes in. The hermit card represents the desire for knowledge. See, he's not in a state of knowledge. He's not the purified being in the white robe. He has gray robes on. He's humbled. He knows that he doesn't know. He knows how much he still has to learn. And he's lighting the lamp to go off in search of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. That, again, has been the, the color I've used to direct this whole um, you know, presentation for today because this is supposed to be about wetting someone's appetite to help to spark within that, the individual the desire for greater knowledge, the desire for more knowledge about the occult and what it really contains and how it can really help to transform oneself. So that's what we have to aspire as a species to become. Then we could start making progress out of Malkuth. And there's desire within a good number of people. You know, like, if, like I said, if I thought it was hopeless, folks, I wouldn't say a word. It can still be done, even at this late hour. It's a matter of will we do it, you know? So let's move to the next card at the eight position. And this would be, we would be at the solar plexus chakra level on the tree of life at this point. Again, this is a dualistic chakra. This is a dualistic level of the tree of life. There is, on the feminine pillar, which is depicted on the left side of the Kabbalistic tree, there's the internal qualities of the self. And on the right-hand side, there's externalized qualities. So you have to look at that pillar going up and down the left-hand side, those three cards, that's known as the pillar of severity. But in Kabbalistic terms, what that pillar represents is internal qualities. It can represent darkness as well, if you look at it from a certain perspective. That which is not readily seen, which is on the inside, that you have to penetrate a little bit deeper to see or to find. And then these three cards on the right-hand pillar, the pillar of mercy, are the, the more masculine or active properties of the self, as we'll see. Okay, So at this uh, level, this is the courage or strength card. And... The two aspects of will, there's an internal quality, which is courage, right? You, courage is developed within. Then you have to do something in the external world to bring courage into manifestation, to act upon it. And then we go to the next level and we see that's the chariot, which represents will in the tarot. So you had the one card with the woman holding the uh, lion's mouth open fearlessly, which represents courage. Okay, that's an internal feminine quality. Now you have the masculine quality of getting things done in the real world, the will to act. All right, so these are both the solar plexus will center, but the dualistic aspects of it. One is an internal aspect, a feminine aspect, and one is a external or masculinized aspect. All right, we're gonna move up to the um, Tiferet card, which is the heart chakra. Tiferet is beauty. And again, there we have the symbol of the heart, the lovers. Uh, I, the symbolism is so consistent. It's so consistent when you learn this arrangement of cards. The, the people who developed the tarot deck clearly studied it in conjunction with the ancient Hebraic systems, Kabbalah, and all, even older systems. And these cards clearly were around long before even those traditions because they came out of the ancient Commission tradition. As many researchers, no, not the least of which was Michael Tessarion, has done a lot of work to establish and end that debate, hopefully. Um, but, you know, the, the, the 
generative principle is depicted here, the union of the ma male and female. You know, it's not just about sexual union, we're talking about unifying the masculine and feminine aspects of self, such that we develop true care, the generative principle. And again, that is the lover's card depicted right in the middle of the tree of life. This position, the Tiferet position on the tree, every card is connected to. Every card has direct path, line of sight to the Tiferet card because that's the central focus of the tree. The generative principle, the heart, is at the core of everything, what we care about enough to, to do in our life or to put into manifestation in our life is actually what gets done and gets manifested. And that's, the, that's why it's called the generative or creative principle. Let's move up another level, and we are at the severity sephirot, geburah. The hierophant is there. Now, this card is placed on the pillar of severity. It's at the sphere called severity, geburah, and it, this card represents working with the self, actually motivating yourself to change. And that's why it's called severity. It's like the, the, the parts of yourself you have to whip into shape. The parts of yourself you don't want to be kind to because you want to change. And those qualities you should want to change. The dark aspects within us that we need to work upon. That's what this card represents. Getting in and working with. That's why it's the Pope. It represents internal religion. Getting the reins over those dark aspects of the self. It's a, this is a card representing self-control. You know, religion's one of the control systems, but true religion can be a motivating force if we're guiding our actions toward truth, if the religion is tr about truth. So this is about self-control. This is about reeling in the aspects of the self that we need to reel in. When we move to the mercy uh, sephirot, uh, sephira, um, which is... Um, uh, has said, we see that in that position we have the emperor card. And again, this is the twin aspect to religion. We have the state now, the emperor. So you have religion and you have government. Now, this card represents mercy. Okay, this is about how are you going to influence other people around you? The one, the, the other side of this, again, we're at the throat chakra now. So this is all about the voice, right? What kind of internal voice do you work with within yourself? The dialogue that's going on within you, okay? You know, what are you, are you telling yourself? How are you motivating yourself through your internal dialogue to change? That's what the uh, severity card was about, the hierophant. Now we're at the mercy card. We're turning that external to the self. This is the masculine side of the tree of life, where we're saying, how do you influence others in the world? Once you've arrived at a certain level of knowledge and understanding and care, how do you work with other people to help them to manifest change in their own lives? And that's why the emperor is it's the symbol of state, because it's the thing that does influence, quote, unquote, control toward others. I'm not saying that means you want to go out and try to control everybody else, but it's the symbol of external influence, let's call it, whereas the hierophant or pope is the symbol of internal influence upon oneself. I hope that's clear and makes sense to people. We're coming up now to the next chakra, which is the third eye chakra, representing true intelligence. So we have a feminine aspect to that and a masculine aspect to that on the two sides of the tree, respectively. The empress is at the top of the feminine side of the microcosmic or soul tree of life, the personal tree aspects of the tree of life. This is the bina sephira, and bina means understanding. Understanding is an internal quality, as we talked about. You know, it's what goes on within yourself. You, you take in the, the knowledge, you process it through mental processes, and then you come to a level of understanding internally. So this is the feminine aspect of understanding, which is an in internal process. And you could also look at that as a right brain or sacred feminine quality. 
The high priestess, while of course depicting the goddess, in this case the goddess Isis, is a feminine figure on the card. This card represents the top of the masculine pillar on the tree of life as an active quality. The goddess represented wisdom, and you see her between the two pillars, similar in Freemasonry, Boaz and Yaq Joaquin, or Joaquin. And of course, these are corollaries to the pillar of uh, severity and the pillar of mercy in the Kabbalistic tree as well. So again, Freemasonry, Tarot, Kabbalah, they all have to be studied in conjunction with each other. They are not separate sciences. They're really, again, many paths to the same destination. It's a different way of explaining correspondences and knowledge, but you get to the same end result. So the High Priestess card is actually wisdom. This card represents wisdom. Now, wisdom is not an internal quality. Wisdom, as we talked about, is what we do with what we know. It's an active process. It's taking action based upon what you have come to understand. And again, you had to, to get there, folks, the lightning bolt goes, if we look at this blue level, okay, the lightning bolt goes diagonally up left to right past self-knowledge. See, that's knowledge in the middle, the white card, the fool card, as the dot card. So you have knowledge, then at the, the top rung, you have understanding and wisdom. What, what are the, the trivium processes? Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Da'at, bina, hokmah. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom are actually the top triangle of the tree of life before you get to the crown, which is self-mastery, which is sovereignty under the creator, true self-government, okay? So again, this high priestess card, sacred feminine iconography on the card, she's holding the law, Torah, right? In between the two pillars as the balance point. And she represents wisdom ultimately, which is a masculine quality regarding action, what we do with what we know. And when we put what we have, the knowledge that we have taken into ourselves and come to understand and to practice, that's when we are putting wisdom into our lives and into the world, and that's when we move toward the highest level of consciousness, self-mastery, sovereignty, true self-respect, true self-love, uh, actively being, being involved as a magician in this world. The magician is the one who stands between the realms, who stands between the worlds. You know, again, he has his head in the cosmos, but his feet on the ground. He is an anchoring point. He is a bridge. He's bridging the light of the creator down to the world, which is why he has the scepter of power connected to the higher realm, but he's pointing at the earth. And he has all, he's mastered all the forces of nature. The wand, the, sphere, uh, the sword, the, the cup, and the pentacles, earth, air, water, and fire, the four elements again. Okay, so this card represents self-mastery from total ignorance and base identification at Malkuth coming up through all those other characteristics of the self on the personal journey on the microcosmic tree to the highest level to Keter or the crown chakra which represents total self-mastery. The allegory is perfect. How, by, by show of hands, how many people besides in my podcast series have seen this arrangement of cards in, in tarot by a show of hands. One person. Anybody else? Two. Two people. Okay? At three. Okay, three people in the room. To me, this shows, and not in any way uh, trying to make this any kind of a harsh statement, but it shows people don't have in-depth knowledge of how these systems in inter relate with each other and how they fit together. And I'm sure people who are completely unfamiliar with the occult and completely unfamiliar with my work have really never heard of any part of this or ever even seen any interpretations of these cards. Again, I'm not telling you these are the only interpretations that could be given, but look at how well the symbolism relates with the concepts of the tree of life and the spheres upon it. It's, it's a perfect allegory as far as I'm concerned and very, very, very few people study the tarot in this way. 
They don't combine it with the Kabbalistic tradition and they don't see the powerful transformative aspects that that symbolism can play practically in your life if you really deeply, richly understand the symbolism. So I, I just hope that this kind of conveys this in a way that's readily understood. I, I hope it did anyway. I'm gonna move to the macrocosmic tree of life and we're gonna see how that arrangement of the second 11 cards of the major arcana of the tarot tell us all about the forces at work in nature. And I'll also tell us about the two ways that a civilization can go. All right, so let's look at that. So here I've built the macrocosmic tree of life from the second 11 cards of the major arcana of the tarot deck. So I'm starting with card number 11, which is the justice card, which is the most important card in the entire tarot deck as far as I'm concerned. Card number 11, we'll get to why that is. And then I'm moving with the lightning bolt pattern throughout the tree all the way down to card number 20. So really all, all we've done here is, you know, we're adding 10. We started at one before and went to 10. Now every card there is the next, you know, 10, 10 numbers up. So 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Card number 21, the last card of the tarot because it starts at zero and it goes through card number 21. It's not one through 22. It's zero through 21. 21 is a very sacred number. It represents the tripling of seven. That is the number that represents man coming into union with the divine, coming into God-like consciousness, not being God, but coming into a level of consciousness that embodies the divine and embodies, uh, you know, the epitome of spiritual essence or spiritual nature while still being in flesh, while still being incarnate in the physical realm. So in the dot position, again, because the second realm of knowledge in the occult is what? The realm of the macrocosmic laws, the laws that govern the universe both in the seen realm, meaning the physical laws, the physical sciences, and in the unseen realm, meaning the spiritual laws, or in other words, natural law. So in the dot position, we have now the world, or in some decks, the universe. Okay, so we had the soul card in the dot position on the microcosmic tree, and now we have the universe or the world in the dot position, the position of knowledge in the macrocosmic tree perfectly consistent, all right? So I hope people are understanding here, I'm not looking for relationships or, you know, trying to bridge anything. You know, it, it's so consistent when you lay it out this way, it's readily seeable. This is not something I'm stretching for, is, is what I'm trying to get at here. It should be readily be able to be seen by anybody who can make these simple correspondences. So, you know, we have the forces of nature, the lion, the man, the bull, and the eagle. You know, the, the four cardinal points of the zodiac, the four di cardinal directions. You have the, um, the gospel writers they were depicted as, the forces of nature, earth, air, water, and fire, etc. You can go on and on with uh, what those represent. Again, you have that symbol of purity and innocence in the middle of the image holding the two scepters. You know, very similar to how we started in a state of ignorance and moved up to a state of self-knowledge. But it was, there was this purity and innocence card in the middle in the dot position uh, uh, represented by the fool card in the microcosmic tree. And there's the position of the world card on the macrocosmic tree. Again, that is not at one of the sephirot positions, but it is at the dot or knowledge position. So let's start the journey of the understanding of the forces at nature, the forces at work in nature. So in the Malkut position of kingdom, the lowest level base identified consciousness, you have the card called judgment, represented by the angel of revelation blowing the trumpet, a call to awakening. This is a clarion call to awaken. We are being called up out of our slumber. We are being called up out of earthly, you know, base identification 
and ego identification to a higher level of understanding. Some people will answer that call. Some will not. Some will be resurrected. Some will stay dead. Okay, so if they do indeed resur resurrect through desire for light, desire for knowledge, desire for truth, then they will come out of those tombs. If not, they will stay in the realm of judgment, which is Malkuth. Just like you could be the hermit and come out of that realm represented by the wheel of fortune, seeming chance fate, the checkered life of man, the floor of the house in Freemasonry. You know, you can come up in the microcosmic tree to the hermit through desire, through personal desire for knowledge, or you can stay in Malkuth, which represented, you know, the wheel of fortune. Well, this is the same thing on a macrocosmic scale. The universe, the will of creation is calling us calling all species up to a higher level of evolutionary progression out of that base realm. And we can respond to that call or not. Those who are gifted with the capacity for holistic intelligence have the ability to choose whether they will come out of that ego-identified state or not. That's free will. I would say this card represents free will in and of itself. I would say this is the free will card of the tarot deck because it's giving us a choice whether we will receive truth or not. See, this is a card about reception. Again, the theme here is reception. The theme of the day is reception. Reception of truth, reception of knowledge. The, Kabbal the word Kabbalah means reception. It means proper reception, the proper way to receive, the proper way to open up one's mind and heart, you know, to the knowledge of the cosmos, to the knowledge of the self a beautiful tradition when properly understood and used properly. This I consider the free will card of the deck. It's saying you have free will to transform yourself or to stay deadened. And if we move forward, I would say going up to the next level, again, one of the most important cards in the deck, and again, the orange card, another theme throughout the day here, this orange color, representing desire representing choice. This is a card that I feel represents choice. The card represents the light, knowledge, truth, the sun. Again, we saw all of that in the symbolism section. That card is the truth card. What's, what's the light that's calling us up from that Malkuth position that the angel's blowing the trumpet for behind her head? It's the light, it's the sun, it's truth. This is the truth card of the deck. But it also represents a choice because the paths converge from that point. And yes, you could still see we're gonna make our way up in the lightning bolt progression to get to the top of the tree. But the microcosmic tree is slightly different than the, I'm sorry, the macrocosmic tree is slightly different than the microcosmic one because this card represents a choice point. Will you receive truth? Will a civilization receive truth or not? That's what this card is the choice point for. It's the truth card. And it's the choice of whether we will receive truth or not. Now remember, there's the path of severity to the left and the path of mercy to the right. In this arrangement, I do feel that there, are, there is a negative connotation on the left-hand path and a positive connotation on the right-hand path, as we will see when I further break this down. The left-hand path going from this point forward represents the rejection of truth. The right-hand path up the tree represents the acceptance of truth, okay? The middle pillar represents the choice point that we have to either receive or not receive, receive or not receive truth. And then the middle card there, as we will see at the Tiferet position means the care to change, ultimately. That's the change card, all right? So if we decide to, re to not receive truth, to reject truth, we go to this position, okay? So this is the moon, which again, symbolically represented in Freemasonry, that darkness side. It, you can look at it as a feminine symbol, a piece of feminine symbolism as well. But in this connotation, 
It means night, darkness. These creatures here in the traditional um, interpretation of this card, it means ignorance. This has traditionally represented ignorance in the breakdown of the uh, symbology of the moon card. And I would suggest that's what it means here in this position. It means we have not chosen to receive the truth. Conversely, on the active side of the tree, the pillar of mercy, the star card represents all of the other lights of the heavens that are suns. And as such, this is the alchemy card. It represents that we have decided to accept truth into our lives and integrate it. When we move up to the next layer, we're at the heart chakra now. And again, look, folks, that, uh, that yellow level is, that yellow level represents will. Okay, we're making a decision in will, in our guts, whether to accept truth or not. So that ignorance card is a willful position. It's, a, it's taking a willful position. When people reject truth, that's a willful act. And when people accept truth, that's a willful act. So that totally correlates to the solar plexus chakra, the will center. But now we're moving up to the heart chakra. Again, a unity chakra, right? The heart, the generative principle, what ultimately drives change. The generative principle is what creates change in our lives and in the whole society. So this is the change card, and it, this card itself is neither negative or positive. It simply represents change, often sudden change. Because once truth is either accepted or rejected, sudden change follows. And I think the choice point that you know, this symbolically really represents, I think 9-11 was one of the defining hallmarks of our time. And the rejection of that truth, I think, has set humanity off onto the left-hand path. You know, we have to care enough to bring it back to that, you know, point of accepting truth and maybe we can get up the other side, you know, up to the, the middle at the top at some point. But, you know, the, the symbolism of 9-11 here is actually <laughs> very overt, actually. Uh, they, you know, the thunderstruck tower. Sudden change could be for the good, could be for the bad. You know, either way, change is coming. You know, the universe abhors a vacuum and abhor, ab, ab, abhors stagnation. Change is always happening. Now we're moving up to the next level, the throat chakra. Again, you have severity here. What follows the rejection of truth? As you go up that left-hand side, self-imposed slavery under dark forces. This is, the, this is where humanity's at. That's where we're at now because of the level of truth that we've rejected. And I always point out, as do other researchers who have deeply studied the symbolism of these cards, the chains are self-imposed. They're loose around their neck. They could take them off at any time. He's not holding them there with tight chains. Those chains could be easily slipped off over the head. They want to stay in their chains because they want to remain in their ignorance. They've Truth has been presented, it is there, and they've rejected it. And therefore, they're ruled, they're owned. So that's the devil card. Conversely, the other side of the tree represents what could happen if we make the other choice. If we accept the truth of creation in the form of the light of the sun, and we start to go up the right-hand pillar, this is the pillar of mercy, the middle of it, the mercy card, the temperance card, you know, then we're on the road to sovereignty, the road to the crown, right? Everything is flowing. The being is, in, is becoming enlightened. This is the freedom card of the tarot, whereas the devil card is the slavery card. So we have the call to awakening and free will at the bottom. We have truth, the sun card. We have the rejection of truth, the moon card. We have the acceptance, acceptance of truth, the star card. We have change, rapid onset of change, the tower card. We have the slavery card, the devil card. And now we have the card that represents 
freedom societally. Once we have accepted truth, we can have that state of consciousness, freedom. We move through the knowledge card, which is the at the dot position, the world, the knowledge of natural law, the knowledge of the universe, and we get to the final expression of the pillar of severity, death, extinction, stagnation, entropy. This is what ultimately results, the foiling of the evolutionary process. That's what happens when we go up the left-hand path of rejection of truth and slavery, ultimately leading to death, extinction, and undifferentiated chaos at some point. Now, this is the entropy card of the tarot deck. That's the force that this card ultimately represents, the death card. And you're seeing he's mowing down all the institutions. No one is safe. Everyone is going to go. This is the cataclysm card. You know, like we talked about in the theosophy section, eventually, you know, nature abhors when we continually reject truth and, you know, pollute ourselves and the world, and eventually it comes in cleans house. It's the weeding process that can happen and will happen should we not change. So that's the entropy card. Now we go to the opposite side, the active side of the tree of life. And this is the syntropy card, the ordering force. The hangman is not a negative card. It's probably one of the most powerful and positive pieces of symbolism in the deck. This is the enlightened man who is doing the true will. I would call this the true will card. You know, that's the initiate. That's having accepted the truth, having gone forward and worked to create freedom. And now this is the true evolution of consciousness. That's what this force represents. The ordering principle, the evolution of consciousness at the top of the pillar of mercy. This is the evolution card. This is what I would call the syntropy card, the force that counteracts the force of entropy and chaos. This is the order card of the deck. Such powerful allegories rolled into all of this symbolism. I mean, the people who put these systems together you know, all I'm doing here is providing an interpretation. Imagine the level of consciousness of the people who built these systems of symbolism and allegory and interconnect, interconnection between them. You know, it's, we're, we're talking about a whole another level. And then we get to the highest force in creation, the force that governs it all, natural law, justice. The king on his throne that can never be unthroned, can never be dethroned. This is the force of truth and will and freedom and love and evolution and law in nature. It's the will of God card, you could call it. It's the boundary conditions of the creator card. Again, in my natural law seminar, I put this card forward as the card of the tarot deck, which represents natural law itself, because that is what it is. This is what the dark occult wants to dethrone and usurp the position of. They want to be God. They want to be the law. Ultimately, that is the most important card of the entire tarot deck because it is the law card itself. And this is the, the understanding of natural law is ultimately the only thing that can resurrect this species and put us onto a new path. That is what the dark occultists don't want us to understand, which is why I have always referred to the knowledge of natural law as the most occulted knowledge on the earth. And I'll end this presentation the same way I ended last year here in Connecticut by saying the law is king and can never be dethroned from its proper place 
at the crown, at the highest level of creation and the highest level of authority in the universe. This is the only authority that exists in the universe, natural law. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your kind attention today. Latin phrase there, lex rex, simply means the law is king. We'll open up the floor to some questions, and uh, I'll take a couple of questions, then we'll take a little bit of a pause, and we'll do the, uh, we'll do the raffle drawing. If we can uh, turn on the lights, because I don't think I need the slides anymore from this point forward, so I could see the audience a little bit, that would be great. Great. Yes, first question, go right ahead. Speak up really loud because we don't have a microphone to help other people to hear, so really project your voice as much as possible. It's actually not a question, it's a strong suggestion. Okay. The um, symbol, the O with the dash. Yes. Whatever it appears, it's a trident. Okay. Normal is Devil's Pitchfork, it's a sonic. Mm -hmm. It's a group for some IL. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. That could also look, it also looks somewhat similar to the Greek S character as well. Yeah. The Sigma. Yes? Can you comment on the, um, the, th the Thoth deck uh, by Alistair Carley? Oh, it's a great deck. It can be used uh, in the same way that you talked about. Sure. This, yes, it can. Even though he switched some of the cards. He switched two of the cards. This is called the 811 reversal in the tarot. For people who have studied it, a lot of people don't really understand it or know about it. Um, I tried to figure out what it was about until I understood this arrangement of cards. I didn't grasp why Crowley did that. He was basically putting courage as the highest force that the universe rewards in nature. I don't look at that as a, an acceptable reversal personally, which is why while I like the symbolism of the Thoth deck and some of the other Golden Dawn decks, I do not agree with the reversal of taking the justice card, which represents natural law down from the 11 position at the top of the ma macrocosmic tree of life. That's a uh, reversal that takes natural law down from its position of authority at the top of the universal tree, which shouldn't be done. I do understand why certain magicians looked at that reversal as a good reversal because they felt that courage was dead in humanity and that courage needed to be crowned the king. It's like in the Wizard of Oz, my Wizard of Oz presentation, I talked about this reversal because the, the cowardly lion is crowned king in the Wizard of Oz, because they're saying only when we crown courage as the king of humanity is anything going to change here. It's the only thing that could really get us in, into alignment with natural law, courage. Courage is one of the big factors that you can't create in anybody else. It's an internal quality that can only be created by the self. So that's why they did that reversal. I like the kind of idea behind also putting the courage card in the high position because you know this, it's this idea that uh, nature will come to our aid if we are bold and courageous. I love that idea personally. I talk about it all the time. But I still don't agree with the reversal of those cards. I do understand why they did it, but I personally would never make that reversal because you can't move that card from its position. What is the Eight and eleven. Card eight and eleven are reversed. So th this is card eight. Justice is card eight in the Thoth deck, and courage is card eleven in the Thoth deck, because he's trying to put courage on this tree. It doesn't belong on that tree. It belongs on the will position. Uh, I believe it is um, uh, hold the hold position in uh, in on the uh, microcosmic tree. He has moved it to to position 11, which is Keter on the macrocosmic tree. It, it's, like I said, it's a reversal that I understand, but I do not agree with. Yes? Hey, Mark, thanks for everything you did. Thank you. And this, this was great. Um, I've listened to all your work, as much as I have gotten up to on the podcast anyway, with 162, where I'm at right now. Cool. Um, 
which is hard to get through the cosmic abandonment stuff, you know, that really is helping me a lot. Right. And I appreciate it. Cool. But those episodes are really hard for me to like power through like I did the first 160. Right. You know? <laughs> I'm going to provide some background material and um, some... Uh, uh, go through some ancient writings that alluded to this stuff uh, in future presentations. Yeah, well, like on the microcosm, yeah, that's, that's like blowing my mind, but then the microcosm taking oh, yeah. itself is yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah, what's, what's going on here on the earth as a result, yeah, yeah. I mean, myself. Is what I'm sure, about. sure. Um, but anyway, so I have a couple things. Mm -hmm. So throughout the time of listening to your podcast, I've always wondered what you mean by the creator. Mm -hmm. I don't want yeah, I don't look at it as a personal force. I look at it as an underlying intelligence in nature that is the life essence that underlies everything so and gives motion to everything. Nature. I mean, that's how I always think of it as like nature is like the all. That's how I always. Yeah, it's an it's an acceptable way. I look at it as law, quite honestly, and not to say I don't think it has any aspect of care to it. I'm not saying that, but. It's, um, it's something that is just a unifying force, you know, within everything. That, that's, it. that's what I look at it as. I don't look at it as a man, a being, a woman. It's, it's a force of intelligence that drives everything forward. It wants evolutionary development. It wants growth for itself, the, whole, the all. You know, that's what that's, we're all part of. Why does right. it want to do that? There's, no, there's nothing else. Why does it want to drive forward? Know the self. Why know the self. Know the self? That's, that's it. it. Everything comes down to those two words. You know, that, that was the mysteries. Know the self and you know the universe. That's what the universe is trying to do. That's it. It's all about understanding, gaining through experience, having an experience in a differentiated state. you say that the tumultuousness or the chaos right now is actually a tool to be used to grow consciousness faster? I would not because I would say it's not necessary to get to that level of chaos. Those lessons can be learned without going through those extremes of suffering. It's like, it's like what we're doing is we're punishing ourselves when we have so much potential we don't need to do it because we're a self-loathing species and we're stuck in this rut of believing that we're, we don't have the worthiness to transform this condition. And it's unnecessary. It's like, I, I like the phrase, I like this spiritual teaching, evil is only necessary until we recognize that evil isn't necessary. Right. That's it. Yes. I have one more thing. Sure. I'll come back cool. later. I was reading some books by like, uh, Paul Foster Case mm -hmm. and Franco. Sure. He has some great stuff on the Rosicrucian tradition as well, Case. Yeah, and, um, they said, you know, I've read that you that won't truly understand the Kabbalah unless, or the Tree of Life, mm -hmm. It would help. I mean, you know, it, you could you could get into the study of the language and what the the sefirot, uh, you know, have traditionally been used to represent, and you you can gain a, a good understanding of it from that. Do I think it's absolutely necessary? It, it's like you know, this is a system of correspondences. That's what has to be really understand the most when it comes to any occult symbolic system. Somebody else's interpretations of the spheres on the tree might be slightly different than mine, and that doesn't mean that they would be wrong or that I would be wrong because they disagreed with some of my interpretations. You know, it's a way of interrelating information and corresponding ideas. And, you know, if we look at those spheres, how I laid them out today in conjunction with these cards, I think you could see the clear overlap and the clear correspondence. Yeah, you related to the data, right? Sure, like that too. A lot, a lot yep. Right. So uh, would I say it's absolutely necessary? I wouldn't make that statement, but I would say it wouldn't hurt. And, you know, to study, uh, you know, other languages and other traditions is always a plus. So I think it would, it would be a good complement to the study of Kabbalah, definitely. Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the root of all the Romance languages, and that means that it's ultimately one of the biggest uh, etymological roots of the English language as well. So just a lot of English words come from that, and 
probably one of the easiest ways or the more unified ways to say something in English but not use English to, so to make it kind of esoteric to do it. Most people traditionally use Latin to do that. It's kind of just an agreed upon thing, especially in the West. So I wouldn't say there's any specific magical or mystical significance to it. I would just say, um, you know, since so much of a percentage of the English language comes from Latin in its origins, that's where a lot of the people who are involved in esoterics have decided they're gonna, you know, they're gonna use that language to uh, write something that they would not rather write in uh, mundane terms. That's my interpretation of it anyway. I don't think it has any other deeper significance than that. Yes? So on the macrocosmic tree of life, that's governed by natural law. Uh, my interpretation of that would be natural cycles. So you, do you think that we can avoid the catabolic cycle that's represented by death in that macrocosmic path? Yes, I do. Like I said, I wouldn't be saying anything if I didn't think it was avoidable. Um, that doesn't mean that it will be avoided. Again, can and will are two completely, drastically different things. Can it be done? Yes, even at the place where we're at now, it can be done. Will we choose to do that work? <laughs> That's not up to me. I, I, don't, I don't have that answer. But if I didn't think it was possible, I wouldn't be here in this room trying to say a word to anybody. I'd, I'd be at home, you know, saying, oh, it's all done, it's all over. I don't think we're at that point yet, but are we approaching it? If we're not careful, we're approaching that point. Like I said, at some point nature says en enough and no further. You know, it, o it only takes the kind of abuse and rejection that we're dishing at it for so long. Yes? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, in your opinion, as, <clears throat> as someone we obviously have a little bit of regard for uh, symbolism, mm -hmm. what do you think of that if that symbol should just be? I would love to see the swastika reclaimed and erase, or as much as possible, mitigate the memory that has been attributed to that symbol through the Nazis. Um, I think we should reverse it back around to its original configuration, not in the SS. Uh, you know, configuration, but in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the like, 2-2 two, two configuration, the backwards configuration of it, and help people to understand that this was an ancient symbol that represented the sun, the, the path of the sun, that represented knowledge, enlightenment, good fortune, goodwill toward other humans, goodwill toward other beings in general. And in the Vedic tradition, when it was used as such, and even in the Native American traditions when they used it, this was a symbol of hope. And I feel it should be completely reclaimed. But people should do it in a way where they really explain how it was used before, explain how they are re-reversing it, that it was reversed by the dark occult orders that, uh, you know, the dark occult Teutonic orders that came in pre-World War II Germany and essentially took that culture over and then worked through you know, dark occult forces to bring Nazism into that region of the world. And you know, they should explain how that happened through the occult and they should explain what this symbol originally meant and how it was pillaged. You know, and then hopefully they, people can quote unquote take that back. I'd love to see it happen. Are there too many people who are closed-minded to allow that to happen and just see symbols in a totally unidimensional sense? Maybe. But I'd personally like to see it happen. I'm all for that. Thank you. Yes. So 1111 is a very positive connotated number. How much time? 730. A little after 730. Okay. I'll do like maybe five, five or so more questions because I want to preserve my voice a little bit. It's already feeling a little bit rough. But then if you want to make an announcement regarding where we might want to meet up or continue discussion afterward, if anybody wants to go, you know. But you still need to do your wrap -up. Oh, the raffle too, so what, right. All right. I'm gonna take th three more questions after this gentleman, so you and then three more, then we'll do the raffle and then we'll probably have to break after that. So go ahead, continue. So 1111 being a really positive connotative number of uh, calling nature, 
Is there an inverse to that that's basically a, hey, you were going right, but you made a mistake, turn around? I haven't seen a synchronistic number that, that kind of put that forward. Maybe 9-11, maybe the number 9-11. You know, if I had to pick one number that m yeah. maybe if you've seen and seen a lot that may be trying to tell you you're not on the right path, my guess mm -hmm. would be something that is equivalent to 92, 911, because, you know, that's the number of failure of will. No, the number of will is 93 in the occult. Yes? Um, uh, I have a question about the Bible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. And um, I know it's an important information aid, so anybody can build a website or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm sort of a beginner in this whole uh, you know, world because I'm you know, learning stuff that for my, myself, thinking for myself, training them, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like I want to share the knowledge that I'm gaining, but I also feel like, all right, I, don't, I didn't go through my uh, logic, grammar, and rhetoric. Enough for me to, you know, really go in depth and explain it to somebody. Yep. I don't just want to go and scratch the surface. Right, right. But I know we're also running out of time. Yes. And if we haven't spread the word, so. I think I really know what you mean because I went through the same process and these same feelings. My best advice to you is don't wait too long. <laughs> don't wait too long. I'm not telling you if you feel like you're not really ready to just immediately do it. Prepare yourself and then get out there and do your best. I feel like I waited too long. You know how long I sat on a lot of this stuff that I, I've known for a long time and didn't say a word until somebody, you know, put a foot in my ass, you know? And I, I kind of beat myself up over it for thinking back on it and saying, why did I wait this long to do this? You know, so. Well, I know, I'm, I know a lot of people. You know there's something wrong, and you're questioning it, and then, you know, I guess for most people, at least for me, is that, you know, somebody said something and it just clicked, and you're like, oh, well, that's what it is. Right. Then how, you know, that, again, it's, what's the minimum action to take? Because I know you have to take action, and, of course, the first thing you want to do is, like, wake up the people next to you, and they're like, oh, yeah, uh, are you going to I, I would say, again? don't look at it in terms of minimum action, look at it in terms of best level of effect effectiveness from where your skill set is at. That's my advice. I would say target what you know the best, what you're the best with as far as material goes, and then use the skills that you're the best with to target that information to whatever audience you're gonna put it forward toward. And I would say don't wait too long, but I would also say don't rush it either but um, don't fall into the habit of second guessing yourself and waiting too long. If you feel you're knowledgeable on something, share it. I'll do two more questions. Yes. Mark, uh, thank you for having the courage to do what you're doing. Thank you. Um, my question is, having a, a deep knowledge of this information, these esoteric traditions, the dark cultists, but the people who use this in a dark way, right. Don't they realize that they're actually enslaving themselves through this and they're creating an environment around them that they'll never truly be free? Okay, I, I, I will answer this by telling you direct knowledge of the mindset of some of the dark occultists, uh, namely Satanists, that I worked with in my past. Their worldview is such that the laws of nature that govern moral or immoral behavior, in their mindset, in their worldview, means that the whole universe is a prison to them. That is their worldview. This is the dark occult worldview. Anybody that thinks that the entire system of nature is a prison thinks like a dark occultist. I do not have that worldview. That's a poisonous worldview. The laws of nature are not here to enslave us. Because I live under the laws of nature, I am not a slave. I am a sovereign being operating in the unity of nature, period, under the laws of the Creator. That's a positive worldview as far as I'm concerned. That's an accurate worldview as far as I'm concerned. Here's their worldview. 
The laws of nature are in place. We know this. Therefore, we also know we cannot do whatever we want without consequence to ourselves. We hate this. We reject this. We will not live under this law, okay? We are going to turn that law on its head by getting other people largely to do our dark work for us as order followers. As such, they will take the brunt of the natural law effect or karmic effect of the actions, the behaviors that are taken. We will largely be insulated from that karmic consequence because we didn't actually take the actions. And they're correct. I, you know, this is another reason. One of the main reasons people hate my work, some people who hate it, really hate it, is because I tell them the dark occultists are not going to have the level of karmic debt and the brunt of karmic consequence that an average order follower will. The average ignorant order follower who is a know-nothing house slave who doesn't care, all he cares about is a paycheck, all he cares about is pushing people around to make his absolute low self-esteem, you know, prop it up and make himself seem like some kind of a badass, okay, is going to take infinitely more consequence from the universe than a sorcerer who completely knows how he's manipulating that being's consciousness like a puppet on a string, yet does not actually lift a finger to physically perform a harmful action to another living human being. And I'm telling you that's unequivocally true. And people hate me for saying it. Now, the problem is most people are willing to help them get their work done in ignorance. And their worldview is very similar to their worldview. Uh, everything's dark, everything's bad, people are bad by nature, you know? And what the dark occultists think is, this is a prison, Earth is a prison, the universe is a prison, well, we got our little corner of the prison where we're gonna be the gang thugs of. We're gonna rule in hell instead of serve in heaven. That's the whole satanic slash dark Luciferian ideology in a nutshell. If you understand their worldview and how they think, you understand they don't care about having any kind of karmic consequence done unto them. They want to have life extension technology, so they, they push that off as far as it can be pushed off. And again, they're trying to assuage to dissuade the brunt of that karmic impact by getting other people to do their work for them physically. One more question. Yes. One question for you. I'm going to uh, deal with taking action. Uh, one of the big things that you did for taking action is sharing a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. However, the opposing force in this universe actually uses physical force, physical violence yep. to impose that That's action. right. Is your stance that we should just be sharing knowledge to basically defend ourselves against that, or should we actually use physical force when the time comes to actually counteract? Let me tell you that? something. Anybody who isn't a very heavily armed human being is a stupid human being. That's all I have to say. I'm a well-armed person. You know, I'm. I'm, I'm I, I'm not a pacifist. By any stretch of the human imagination, I think pacifism is the most deplorable ideology on the face of the earth. What's the point of the knowledge if you don't take action, right? Yeah. If you have knowledge that sovereignty is the truth of creation, that is, it is the truth of your being, what good is that knowledge if you're not willing to defend that sovereignty when it comes under physical violence by another person? You know? You have the right to defend yourself with physical force, which is nonviolent. The defense through the usage of physical force is not the application of violence. Sorry, it's not the same thing. Anybody that thinks that is wrong, is wrong. They are incorrect, you know? So, you know, I'm not telling everybody, pull a trigger at the drop of a hat either, okay? I think exercising the level of tolerance to teach this to as many people who are willing to listen is the first step. But hey, teaching wasn't going to dissuade the Nazis from doing their horrors, you know? It wasn't going to change the minds of the secret police of, of the Soviet Union, okay? It wasn't, that, wasn't going to ha that wasn't going to happen that way, you know? At some point, 
I would advocate for physical pushback. Uh, like I said, I'm not a pacifist. I think people try to portray somebody like Gandhi as being some kind of a prop, propped up on a pedestal figure because he advocated nonviolent resistance. Gandhi didn't get it done. Jesus Christ didn't get it done. Okay, we're still in slavery, folks. It's not done yet. You know? I'm not saying don't learn from those figures either. Okay, but Gandhi once said, and this is what a lot of people who uh, you know take his ideology as uh, you know in support of a pacifist ideology said, at some point in his life, you know, if we had guns to resist, it would probably be a good idea to employ them. But we don't have them. They let them take them all. They let the British Empire take all their weaponry. You know, it's the same thing. Yeah, this is something I'm going to also hammer on on my work in the future. I'm going to be getting deep, more deeply into gun rights than I have before in the past. I'm going to really try to emphasize the importance of what the Second Amendment was intended to be. I'm not a constitutionalist either. I think all government is an illusion. All government is, you know, a coercive system. But the concepts contained in the Bill of Rights, some of them I think are embodying natural law principles, particularly the Second Amendment. Just to follow on with that, that question. Don't you feel that if we go too far pushing the knowledge without taking like an affirmative action and actually kicking back the force that's hitting us, like flatten the face? Hey, Mark, I'm actually going to 7.45. Okay, great. We'll do the raffle in one minute. Uh, I'll just answer this brief question. This is one of the reasons I don't really too much support um, protests. Because people come to protests with no teeth. Right, not protests. And the cops bring violent weapons, yeah. you know? I'm not interested in that. When you, when you want to protest where you're going to back up your right to speak with teeth, I'll be there. But if you're not, I don't, I don't want any part of it, you know? So, you know, when people understand, you need to say, I have not only a right to speak, but I have a right to stop you from stopping me from speaking. <laughs> then we'll be making progress. Those beings don't have the right to stop you from free assembly and speech, which are natural inherent rights. So when we want to, uh, you know, put a protest together with teeth, then I'll, I'll be at that. Uh, who knows? We're gonna do our, we're gonna do our raffle. So let's bring up the tickets and I'll announce the winners. I'll pull the winners. people look I'll wait one more minute anybody who wants tickets get them now from Barb bring the tickets up here throw them in the bag I'll make the, the drawing thank you for the oh thank you so much put them in there mix them up here we go. The, the first prize is a What on Earth is Happening DVD of your choice. A, a Mark Passio DVD of your choice. Here we go. You pick the winner. Get in there in the middle. <laughs> Not on the periphery. Okay. Here we go. First winner is number 757173. Seven five seven one seven three. Give him whatever DVD he wants. Just check the number. That's the last one by him. Great. Yeah, right. Okay, you're gonna get a DVD of your choice from up there. A single DVD of your choice. Okay. I'll pick the next one. Seven five seven one six one. You, you get a t a t-shirt. 
a free t-shirt of whatever size you want. Oh, she gave us two t-shirts. Cool. They gave us two t-shirts. Great, great, great. They made up. That prize was a free t-shirt of whatever size you want. Seven, five, seven. This is for a t-shirt and a single DVD of your choice. Seven, five, seven, one, five, two. One, five, two. There you go. All right. Make it a t-shirt and a disc? T-shirt and a disc. Single disc. I just want to say, uh, what's got you, man? Thank you. I just saw it by stuff and uh, 